NFL Super Wild Card Weekend Prop Bets. Hitman, glad to be teamed up with you throughout the postseason. When we get to the playoffs compared to the regular season, fewer games can mean fewer prop betting opportunities. And at the same time, with a lot of these games being standalone, high attention matchups, we get bigger menus for most games. So overall, how does the playoffs versus regular season dynamic change your betting approach? Yeah, um, it, it's tough to say because I, I like the fact that with the playoffs, there's some books that I have that normally don't put up props that are putting them up. So that's good because there's more ways to get down. And sometimes they'll have different numbers and all that because they're not exactly the sharpest with putting up numbers because they haven't been doing it all year. So that's one of the positives. And I do feel that if you really like something because of that, you could get a lot more down typically. And some of the books are willing to take more action uh, in, in the playoffs. They're willing to take bigger limits and it gets higher, especially once you get to the Super Bowl. They're willing to take a little bit bigger limits on the prop action. So that's good. Um, the negative is that there's so much attention on these six and then four and then two games and then one game that the lines get a lot tighter. There, there's so many eyes on these lines that once one person, one service gets to it, it's gonna be it's gonna be beat up, and there's not a 16 game slate no more to, to pivot to. So that's what's tougher. And just honestly, the books are also paying a little bit more attention to their openers, and the lines do tend to be more efficient. So a rule of thumb that I kind of have is that I feel like my ROI, maybe if I simulated the season, I simulated a thousand seasons or whatever regular and postseason, my ROI would definitely be a lot better in the regular season compared to the postseason. But the postseason, if I really want to get down on something, I'm going to be able to get a, a higher limit typically, especially the closer we get to the Super Bowl. So there's pros and cons. And we'll see where we can find some bets potentially worth getting down on as we approach Wild Card Weekend. Kicking things off will be Seattle and San Francisco and Hitman on the Dream Preview this week. Your best bet, Geno Smith, under 230 and a half passing yards. Current consensus price has trickled down to 227 and a half. I'm wondering if your book, if that's still actionable, and if so, any handicapping highlights that might be a good nudge for somebody considering following. Yeah, 227 and a half is probably the floor of where I'd go down to, especially because it opened at 234 and a half. So I think 227 and a half is probably as low as I would go to on Geno. You know, you have the weather factor, and right now it's supposed to not be that bad. It'll, it'll, it'll affect the game a little bit, but it's not going to be like totally detrimental or anything. But from like the forecast I'm seeing, there's potential that it could change. Like basically the big rain is supposed to come before and after the game. And, but this far out, two days out, it could easily go into the game at some point, whether it's the first half, second half, full game, et cetera. So definitely just having that factor would, it is definitely a plus, um, so I kind of play, I played a lot of unders in this game on, and I just think that the weather is a added bonus already unders that I was looking towards and any type of bad weather, it, it's just a free roll for us. So I thought that the Gino one was my favorite play in this game. They've been running the ball a lot more the last three weeks since Pete Carroll came out saying that he was going to look to run the ball more and Kenneth Walker's run for over a hundred yards. Gino's been, um, I think, 200, 200, and 180 yards in those three games. And it's obviously a really tough matchup. So I like that. I played some Purdy unders in the low 220s, 223 and a half, 222 and a half, and 221 and a half, I believe, were, were my numbers on that game. That one, a little bit of the weather and just the fact that Seattle's a run funnel and San Francisco in their playoff history with Shanahan's been really run heavy, 10 point favorite. Purdy first playoff game. You can see a, a situation where they're running a lot. Um, 
I like Christian McCaffrey. I played him over 69 and a half rush yards. Do I like it at 73 and a half? I'm still going back and forth if that's going to end up being a buy for me because I didn't get a full bite at the apple on 69 and a half. So 73 and a half is a potential look. Uh, Brandon Ayuk under 47 and a half. I played Noah Fant under 27 and a half. Just a lot of games that I liked. A lot of players I liked under in this game to begin with. And the potential weather was just an added bonus. All right. Well, we'll keep close tabs on the forecast. And as people hear this closer to kickoff, also keep a close eye on how far some of these numbers have moved for some of them. If the best of it has sailed, no need to force your hands, but a lot of options here. So with a bigger attack surface, possibly still one or two angles that will be viable for a good bit longer. Following up Seahawks 49ers on Saturday will be my chargers traveling across the country to take on the Jaguars in Jacksonville and Hitman one prop. I wanted to run by you in this one. Steve Fezzik mentioned it in passing in that same dream preview episode. He touched on possible value on Austin Eckler receiving yards over. Now the current number for that is 35 and a half. And right away, I needed to remind myself that you have mentioned multiple times on this show this season that playing running backs to go over their receiving yardage number can be a pretty dangerous game. And at the same time, in the case of this particular bet, It's a pretty favorable matchup with a Jags D that's not the best at limiting running backs in the receiving game out of the backfield. And with Eckler specifically from a betting market standpoint, seems like his numbers have been suppressed with the Chargers receivers getting back into the fold. And in this case, Mike Williams hasn't practiced all week, but it sounds like he's probably going to play. I feel like even if he does play, he's going to be limited and that could open up more opportunity for Eckler. So any interest as much as playing running backs, passing yard, or excuse me, running back receiving yards over. It can be very dangerous. Any interest in Eckler at this number of 35 and a half? Um, probably not going to be a play of mine. Uh, I will say that if Williams plays, it's definitely not a play of mine. And But if Williams doesn't play, you know, I could theoretically see a world. Eckler was getting so much of his receiving production when like Allen and Williams were hurt. So if Williams is out, I could see a world where the, the 35 and a half maybe tick up a little bit. So you might get some closing line value if you're able to get a stale 35 and a half if Williams gets hurt. So that, that's really my opinion on that. Um, as far as the rest of the game, I, I know Eckler, and th- this made me lean. I, I, I haven't bet one thing in this game prop-wise. So... Uh, I'll say that, but I lean towards maybe Eckler over rush yards around 50 and a half. And one of the reasons was that Eckler coming into the season, he was open that he wanted that he was going to conserve his body and that he wanted to share carries and he didn't want the full workload. So because he wants to have a long career and not take that beating and Now it's the playoffs. So when it's the playoffs, there's no more. You're taking the training wheels off. It's going to be full go. So as much as I wasn't as in love with the receiving over, if if Williams plays, just because Eckler's receiving numbers have been so much worse when the Chargers have had their full complement of weapons, Eckler in the rushing game was a lean for me to go over. But Again, it's a, maybe I'll end up having a play, some plays by Saturday. I'm sure I will because I'll find some some off numbers and all that. But as far as widely available numbers, I haven't bet anything in this game yet. One game prop I'll run by you for this one. Under 10.5 accepted penalties. I'm seeing that with some decent availability in the price range of minus 125. And shout out to Hector, who uh, goes by at SH8model on Twitter a great form contributor going back to David Molinsky's days, writing the point blank column and a a really sharp follow on Twitter. I saw him note that he was playing this and I don't have his full handicap, but my point of view right away, it triggered a thought that penalties under is often a part of my Super Bowl prop portfolio. It's important to get down on that one, usually pretty early before numbers get hammered into place, but beyond the Super Bowl, Maybe it's still more likely than not that refs are going to swallow the whistle when in doubt throughout the course of the playoffs. So season long averages could be inflated with some of these penalty props. Any thought on Chargers, Jags, penalties under 10 and a half? I mean, it makes logical sense. It's usually something that I look towards playing in the Super Bowl as well. Um, It it makes logical sense for for the playoffs for for that to happen. 
all eyes are in this game. The, the, the NFL doesn't want the refs to take it over and let them play. But I'd, I'd probably have to see the data on it. But, um, but yeah, I, I, it, the logic makes sense. Another factor that would be nice to see some data on, but we don't have nearly enough to probably have a strong stance. Looking at Miami, Buffalo, a lot of uncertainty with the Dolphins quarterback situation at this age. We know it's not going to be Tua. And whoever goes, we just have a small sample size of these other guys in this offense. How is that dynamic affecting your outlook for Dolphins Bills? It kind of soured me a little bit on some Bills overs. Uh, I played Diggs rush yards and and also his passing yards at the opener. It was 49 and a half and 253 and a half. The numbers got bet up a little bit. Pass yards is like high 250s. Rush yards is still 50 and a half. So it's only moved a yard. But I just I sou- I stopped adding to it because I just soured a little bit with them being now 13 and a half point favorites. Mm-hmm. I know all the logic is there about Allen being more willing to run in high leverage situations. And Miami is a pass funnel. But the reason I stopped is because I'm just nervous that the game does get out of hand and this Miami offense doesn't threaten Buffalo enough. And it just that that's where the rush yards doesn't get there. Um, I, I think that he's going to hit one. He's going to hit the pass yards over the rush yards over. It's just a matter of me predicting which one it's going to be. So I don't dislike the play. Like I haven't like bought out of it or anything. Any of the two plays I, I'd call them strong leans at this point, but with, if I could have got a more competitive spread, I probably would have added more money to those plays with the rushing angle on Josh Allen in particular. I like that you brought up the blowout potential that could put a damper on the enthusiasm. And also I'm, I'm starting to hear a lot of people talk about Allen rushing yards over and mobile quarterbacks in general in the playoffs. I understand to your point, these are higher leverage games. So season long averages could be misleading but I'm starting to wonder if the cat's gotten out of the bag when it comes to mobile quarterbacks putting more on the line when it comes to using the running game in the playoffs. Even if we look back to, I know it's a regular season game, but Buffalo, Kansas City, week six, definitely had a playoff atmosphere. And on this show, we were pretty heavy on Allen and Mahomes rushing yards over. We had a lot of company. Those were heavily bet props to the over. They both came in under. And really, aside from the angle, it all comes down to the number. So if the market is catching on, even some good logic might not have the best value to pair with it anymore. And to your point about the blowout potential here with favorites, I've always got it in the back of my mind that it's pretty likely Allen's going to be taking some knees at the end of this game. How much does all that factor into your thought process when we see him now lined north of 50 rushing yards? Yeah, for sure. And with what you said about the Allen taking knees or whatever, I mean, may, maybe he's taking knees or maybe maybe it ends up being uh, Case Keenum in right. this game if it does take in the knees, if it gets to to be that big of a blowout. But, yeah, I think you, you hit it on the head. I mean, I think, I think Allen rushing and some of these quarterbacks rushing is going to be a popular prop for a lot of people during the playoffs and it's just really going to be a matter of who gets to it first. Cause I mean, think about even a few years ago when the Niners played the chiefs in the super bowl Mm. and it was the worst beat ever when Mahomes lost like 20 yards on Niels at the end of the game. But you know what? It was the worst beat ever for 97% of people, but there was 3% of people that still think he landed like 29 rush yards or something, which meant that like 97% of people lost. But there was a few people that had 26, 27, 28 and a half on Mahomes. But that was like the virgin opener and that you, you couldn't get a ton down on that. But yeah, it's the best example of, I, I think these, some of the quarterback rush yards are going to get bet early in the process. And speaking of virgin openers, it's almost time to keep your eyes peeled already for anything on Patrick Mahomes rushing yards for the divisional round, because that's probably going to shoot up just about as soon as it opens. 
but we can talk now instead of a game with a lot of blowout potential in Buffalo to one that's probably going to be a lot tighter, the Giants at the Vikings. We saw these same teams in the same venue on Christmas Eve. So this is a rematch of something, not just that we saw during the season, but very late in the season. So with that recent matchup in mind, Hitman, any changes since that game to inform how you might bet this one from a prop perspective relative to what you might have done on Christmas Eve? Um, you know, I didn't have many plays in that game, if I remember correctly, and this has kind of been similar. Um, I, I lean towards the Jefferson overs. I know it's as square as it could possibly be at 92 and a half or whatever it is. But when teams blitz Minnesota and play man coverage against Minnesota, he is just absolutely crushed. And he had a really big game against them the first time. So maybe a lean towards Jefferson overs. I played KJ Osborne under 40 and a half receiving yards. Um, for me, it's funny because I was just mentioning how Jefferson's target share is so insane against man coverage. And honestly, I, I could – I can't even believe this stat. I got to double check if it's right. But I saw that Adam Thielen and KJ Osborne are the last and second to last among wide receivers and yards per route run against man coverage with a minimum um, targets for, for the qualifier and everything. So, it, I mean, the, the – the effect of Jefferson getting all these carry or all these targets against man coverage has really hurt Osborne and Thielen. And, you know, Thielen, do I play his under? Well, Thielen's bottomed out as far as his prop number. Like just a few weeks ago, you could play Adam Thielen under 49 and a half receiving yards. And now you're seeing him at 35 and a half. Mm. So that's kind of a guy you're, if you're playing under on Thielen, you're, you're not exactly buying low. But um, Osborne right now, you're you're selling high if you play an under on Osborne. And that 40 and a half, which is the fan duel line right now, I think it's uh, worth a bet to go under. All right. Do we know that? And even at 30 and a half is a consensus number, maybe still a little bit of wiggle room, but with a pretty widely available line of 40 and a half, inclined to think based on your breakdown that that's not going to last a whole lot longer. Speaking of what's not going to last a whole lot longer, hopefully another game with some quarterback uncertainty. It would be nice to know who's going to be under center for Baltimore against Cincinnati on Sunday evening. We saw these two same teams kind of like the previous game with the Giants and Vikings. We've seen them recently, even more recently, these two same teams, same venue just last week. So what do you make of the Ravens quarterback situation and how that's ultimately informing your approach for this one? Yeah, um, I mean, I'm pretty, pretty, Pretty confident it's not going to be Lamar. Um, got some big bets down on the Bengals, minus six and a half. Had a, a we'll call it a feeling I had that Lamar wasn't um, going to be available in this game. So, um, and I, I don't have any word on Huntley, what's going to be the situation with him, but it, I, I, I don't know how long Baltimore stays competitive in this game, to be honest, especially, I mean, if Anthony Brown's starting, it's going to get to 10 in this game. So um, I haven't done much with the props. I mean, Baltimore lines haven't been out really. Bengals lines haven't done much with. Um, maybe I'm interested to see the running back situation at, for Baltimore and see if Gus Edwards plays in this game. He's in the concussion protocol right now. And last week, Dobbins under was a really big play of mine. And a lot of the logic was that, you know, it's a meaningless game and they're going to look to conserve him. Unfortunately, my handicap was so correct on it that J.K. Dobbins was uh, healthy and active because they wanted to conserve him. So it would have been nice if they just gave him a few carries and I won my bet. But um, If only Brandon Staley coached the Ravens. Yeah, well, then Dobbins would have played the whole game, and my bet would have been a coin flip. So, but um, yeah, if Edwards plays, may, maybe uh, keep an eye on the Baltimore rushing props because they did say after their week, uh, their week sixteen or week seventeen game, they said that they wanted to get Edwards some more touches, and they, and then he ended up 
getting a lot of touches early in the game without Dobbins, obviously got a concussion. So um, I'm, I'm just monitoring the Baltimore running back situation. Plenty of uncertainty in that one. Fortunately, on Monday night to close out the week, not as much uncertainty about a lot of the big names to be featured when it comes to Cowboys Bucks. And I'm looking at the trenches for Tampa Bay. It looks like they could be getting some reinforcements back along the offensive line. And I'm wondering if that might open up any skill position prop betting opportunities for Tampa or beyond that angle, Hitman, what else comes top of mind for you when we think Cowboys Bucks on Monday night? Oh, you know, I, I just, I haven't played my, I'm, I'm really surprised with the six game slate that my volume has been as low as it's been, but I, I feel like the market has been pretty tight this week. And I, I feel it, I hate coming in and being like, Oh, I played this and the line has moved. The line has moved now. But um, the only play I made in this game was Rashad white under 40 and a half and under 38 and a half rush yards. Um, I think the line's gone now, 35 and a half. It's a pass. That's the widely available, but I will say that just in case, you know, th sometimes these lines get bet back up and then you could look to, um, to, to bet them then. So I would not bet it at 35 and a half, probably 37 and a half is the lowest that I go to, but I liked Rashad white under, it's just a lot of outs on it. Um, it could be playoff Lenny time for the Bucks in the high leverage spots. Dallas could get a lead on Tampa, which Tampa has fell behind in their fair share of games. Uh, White could just be inefficient because, because the Bucks are the worst rushing team in the league. A lot of ways to potentially cash that one. But, you know, unfortunately, I haven't played any other props in this game. I think it's good to get a glimpse into your process because as we record this Thursday evening, the best of the number is gone in some cases. And there's so much uncertainty in some games that we have a lot to monitor before we could get down in other matchups. So all things considered, as we stand right now, is there anything that you'd feel confident locking into, let's call it a props and hops, super wildcard weekend portfolio? What are we seeing on Gino right now? For I am pretty start. confident we're still on 227 and a half. Is that consensus okay? Yeah, number? I'm seeing 227 and a half everywhere. Yeah, I'm comfortable locking in Gino under 227 and a half. It has moved a little bit. It's probably the low of where I would take it, but it's the widely available consensus number right now. Sounds good. And then with Osborne for those 40 and a half still available, safe to assume that's a go. If we say consensus 38 and a half. Any meat left on that bone? Yeah, that's fine. I, I played some under 38 and a half personally. So that's good. All right. So we've got a couple of props from Hitman and I will close out our picks with surprisingly a couple of teasers I wanted to discuss with you here. Even though we've got a short card with six games, no shortage of teaser appeal, especially when the market is at its most efficient point so far this season. So Getting into the first teaser, the standard six-pointer, good up to minus 120, crossing through those key numbers of seven and three, looking at the Jags teased up to plus eight and a half, paired with Tampa Bay at plus eight and a half. And thinking about Jacksonville, in a way, this is just me maybe being the self-defeatist Chargers fan, fading the Chargers, winning by margin in this one. I, for the life of me, still can't figure out what Brandon Staley was thinking playing his key players as much as he did last week. And I think that that could come back to bite them, if not this week, then at a certain point in the playoffs, given the cumulative effect that those unnecessary snaps can have when we're talking about a team with four straight road games to get to the Super Bowl, if they're fortunate enough to make that kind of run. But for this game on Saturday, I feel like Mike Williams, if he goes, going to be limited and in turn, that can really limit the ceiling of the offense. We've seen them pretty suppressed without him at full strength throughout the course of the season. And for the Chargers, it's also a case of back-to-back -back road games on short rest going from Sunday to Saturday against the Jags opponent having back-to-back -back home games on full rest, having played last Saturday night in that win over Tennessee. So I feel like this could be a pretty close game. Won't be surprised to see either team win it, like Jacksonville up to plus eight and a half. A shorter take on Tampa Bay, plus eight and a half. I feel like this, too, is more of a coin flip game in my book than the point spread would indicate with the Cowboys a pretty clear favorite. 
I know it's a bit narrative-y, but Tom Brady at home against Mike McCarthy, getting more than a touchdown in this teaser. Happy to take that. So, Hitman, what would you say are your thoughts on that first teaser, Jags plus eight and a half paired with Tampa Bay plus eight and a half? I always say that I'll never tell somebody like, oh, I'm going to book your Wong teaser at 120 or whatever. But um, I like the Jacksonville leg of it. The Dallas leg is personally not a play of mine because – or the Tampa leg is personally not a play of mine just because I lean towards Dallas playing minus two and a half. But I can't be opposed to, to the teaser. Um m- uh, if I had to pick one on the board that I like right now, I would do a seven pointer with San Fran and Cincinnati. Yep. But I have a lot of exposure on. It depends how much exposure you have on Cincinnati. I have a lot of exposure on minus six and a half with them, so I'm not really trying to add a ton of exposure right now. But that would be my personal play. All right, well, that's the second one I had teed up so we can talk about it a little bit in both legs, looking at San Francisco and Cincinnati tees down to minus two and a half. Again, this would be a seven point teaser. Consider it good at minus 140 or better, making sure to cross all the way down through that key number of three. Both legs, we've got clearly superior teams at home, taking them to do a little more than one outright. With the Bengals, I don't feel like there's too much more to add than that. And for you know, for that matter, San Francisco, I'll just get to the value of it that I see. I know minus 140 can sound steep, but if we look at a money line parlay on these two teams, which is a very similar bet in theory, the price tag probably going to be in the range of minus 210, even higher than that at some books. And I need to acknowledge a San Francisco or Cincinnati win by one or two points is certainly possible. And in that case, the money line parlay hits and the teaser doesn't. But when we're talking about the difference from minus 210 or more, to minus 140, I think it's worth the risk of a one or two point win for one of these two teams to save 70 cents with a teaser relative to the money line parlay. So do you ever look at things that way? Um, you know, if people are often going to be teasing or excuse me, a lot of people will be parlaying big favorites on the money line, just sucking it up and laying what seems like big, big on a teaser when in fact, it's probably not quite enough. Yeah, no, that that's the way to play it. <laughs> that's the way to play it. Don't be money line parlaying these you're going to get ripped off on the odds all right well glad to hear that we are eye to eye on that seven point teaser with the Niners in Cincinnati I'll do a quick rundown on this week's picks hitman Geno Smith under 227 and a half passing yards KJ Osborne under 38 and a half receiving yards and I will go with two teasers first up the standard six pointer Jacksonville plus eight and a half hosting the Chargers paired with Tampa Bay plus eight and a half hosting the Cowboys and then a seven-point teaser where the two of us have some good consensus. San Francisco, minus two and a half hosting Seattle. And Cincinnati, minus two and a half hosting the Ravens. I will note, in the spirit of full transparency, you touch on it with some of your pre-existing exposure. I have most of my exposure on the Bucks at plus three and on the Bengals in a six-point teaser before this line ticked up even further. So these might be more in the range of pizza bets for me, but I do think they're good bets for those who haven't gotten down yet. And... On that note, Hitman, I want to thank you for staying on board here to finish what we started and see this thing through to Super Sunday. Um, I've really enjoyed this. It's been a highlight every week to do this with you. And I think that for listeners, it's been a huge highlight as well. For those listeners who aren't doing so already, you've got to hit give Hitman a follow on Twitter at Hitman428. You can also find me there at MLandis18. And as a programming note, Props and Hops will be back next week to break down arguably the best NFL weekend of the year with the divisional round, the heavyweights back in action with the Chiefs and the Eagles off their bye weeks. Until then, everyone, best of luck with your betting and beer adventures on Super Wildcard Weekend.